morning, everybody. It's good to have you with us this morning. Good morning, everybody online. We're glad you could join us as well. Uh, so my oldest son, he's six. He's really developing this, this passion for music. Uh, and all, all music, but really electronic music. Uh, his favorite producer right now is a guy named Marshmallow, who wears a big marshmallow helmet on his head and then makes sick beats. Uh, those are his words, not mine. Uh, but he loves music, and he's always kind of dancing a little bit and making little beats in his head. And to be honest, for only being six, he's not a bad little beatboxer. And so I asked him one day, I'm like, Levi, do you want to like start learning how to make music like Marshmallow? And he was very enthusiastic, yes. So I got my computer out and booted up the software and plugged the keyboard in. And then he proceeded to just run his hands all over the place and make a big racket. Like it wasn't, it wasn't good, but it was just like noise. And so I said, let's, well, let's slow down for a minute. Let's work on some, some fundamentals. Let's learn how to do this and build on it. So let's start with like a basic beat. Let's start with how to count out a basic beat and keep tempo. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. And so he did that for about 30 seconds, and then he lost interest. And he just started making racket noise again. And even he recognized this doesn't sound good. Because he started to get a little frustrated and a little discouraged. And he actually got a little emotional in his discouragement. And he said, Dad, why can't I make music like Marshmallow? I said, buddy, he's been doing this for over 10 years. And you haven't even done it 10 minutes yet. Like, it's, it's going to take some time. You've got to practice and you've got to work hard and learn some stuff. But if you stick with it, someday you will produce great music just like Marshmallow. And that wasn't satisfying at all to him. I don't want to do it someday. I mean, yeah, that's great, but what about now? I want to make music now. I want to have fun today. And maybe that's a sentiment that you can resonate with a little bit. Maybe it's not music. Maybe, maybe you've been in that situation where you're trying to learn a skill, or you were maybe like you're in school and you're really sick of school. I was talking to somebody like that this morning. But, you know, you keep studying and you keep training because someday it's, it's going to pay off. Or maybe you've got this, this new hobby you're trying to get into or learn about. And someday you're going to be great at it. But right now it's just kind of stifling and frustrating because you want something today. You want results now. Or maybe it's, it's like a life change situation where you're trying to, to eat better or exercise more or quit smoking or make some sort of healthy life change. And you know that someday it's going to be worth it and someday it's gonna, you're going to be glad you did this. But today it's a little frustrating because you want some results now and you want some, something to see progress today. Sometimes that waiting, that someday, yeah, that's good and all, but we want something for today in the immediate and maybe, if you're honest, maybe you've even felt this way about your faith a little bit, a time or two. Because Christianity is a faith that talks a lot about what God is going to do, and the good things that are coming, and the hope that we have for the future. But we still have to deal with today, with the mess, and the frustrations, and the difficulties of now, and, and maybe you're looking for something a little more immediate that's in the, the conversation we're having this morning, that tension is what we're wrestling with as we continue this series for three weeks now that we've been in called Champions. We've been looking at Romans chapter 8, which for many people is sort of the, the pinnacle of the New Testament because all of this hope and this encouragement and, and this, this, this future longing we have, it all comes together into a very sharp focus where we are reminded that no matter what mess the world may throw our way, we are champions, we are overcomers, we are more than conquerors, it says, through him who loves us. That's our hope, and that's our encouragement. But like we said, while that's all fine and good, and, and yes, we believe that, sometimes we need a little something for today, in the immediate, to get us through today's hardships. That's what we're talking about. If you have your Bibles, why don't you open those up to the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 is where we're going to be, you can follow along there. If you don't have your Bible with you, you can follow along on the screen behind, or you can download the FCC Mammoth app to your mobile device and tap the Sunday button in the bottom right-hand corner. You'll find our sermon notes tool that has our passages pulled up along with our outline, a uh, place for you to take some notes, engage with, uh, and maybe get the most out of our time together today. Now, like we said, Christianity is a faith that talks a lot about the future. The, the good news of the gospel is very future-oriented meaning it looks forward to what is to come. And we see that when we look at our passage this morning. 
If you want to look at Romans chapter 8, we're going to look at verse 18. And, and we've read through this, if you've been with us in the series, we've read through this probably a few times now. But we're going to look at it again. And I would encourage you as we do so, kind of make a mental note of just how often it talks about the future or what is to come. So verse 18, it says this, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. So not what we have today, but something that is coming, something in the future. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. It waits in eager expectation. You don't expect something you already have. You expect something that has not yet arrived. It's coming in the future. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. Hope is a future-oriented action. We don't hope for what we already have. We hope for something that we do not yet possess, but will come in the future. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly. There's another future-oriented verb for our adoption of sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. You can't wait patiently for something that has already arrived. So much of this is pointing towards the future, what is going to come, what God is going to do. There's a strong future orientation to our hope, and that's a good thing. We never want to undersell that. Our passage, it also reminds us of our present struggles. That was week one in our series. We presently experience the frustrations caused by sin and the chaos that has ensued because of it. We presently experience the effects and the fallout of sin as it works its way through the world around us and even works in our own flesh and bones. We read in our passage, creation groans in eager expectation. It groans as in the pains of childbirth. It longs for something, something that is to come. If you've been with us in the series, you know that it's waiting for renewal, for redemption, for that day when God makes all things new and sets things right and actually addresses the mess. We ourselves, we groan inwardly as we await our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies, it says. We are longing for something that is coming because we experience the frustration and the work of sin in our own bodies as they grow older, as they decay, as they fall apart, as they trouble us, as they become a challenge and a frustration. We long for something new. That day when God makes all things new, restores, renews. We're all in the same boat here. We're looking to what is ahead. And God has shown us a picture of that. He has shown us what the finish line looks like. We read it last week. If you weren't with us, you can read it. You probably read it in Revelation chapter 21 before, where God says there's no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. The old way of chaos, the old way where sin reigned and its chaos was experienced, it's done and he who seated on, seated on the throne said, I'm making all things new. That's what we long for. A day when the mess is addressed and God fixes the chaos. And we long for it and we wait for it. And knowing that's what lay ahead, knowing that's what the finish line looks like, is a powerful motivator and encouragement. We see that at work in the world of athletics. When you can see the finish line, for some reason, it fills athletes with an extra burst of energy to keep throwing themselves as fast as they can at that finish line. We, we see this in, in extreme distance competitions, like the ones run by a guy named Simon Donato. Very interesting guy. And when I say extreme distance competitions, I mean extreme. There was one time a, a few years ago, he was running uh, for five days, over 250 kilometers through the Sahara Desert. This was an extreme endurance competition. Not surprisingly, after running 250 miles in the desert, he found himself completely and utterly exhausted, barely able to put one foot in front of the other. And with only 30 kilometers left to go, which we're saying only 30, but when you've run 250, what's 30 more, right? With only 30 kilometers left, he was thinking about quitting, but then something happened to him where his body just kept moving forward. 
And not even like slowly at a snail's pace, but like it was actually speeding up. And the last five kilometers of that day were the fastest he had run in the past two days. And and you might wonder, well, how did that happen? How could somebody go from the brink of exhaustion to running faster than they had in the last 48 hours? He described the experience. He said, my body could feel the finish line. Something about knowing that the end is coming, knowing where the finish line is, fills us with that extra boost to keep going and to push through. And that's kind of what God is giving us in this glimpse of the future and what he's going to do. He says, here is the hope that you have. This this renewal and this restoration awaits. Let it fill you with the energy you need to keep pushing through and to stay faithful in the hardships of the now. It's a phenomenon called teleo-anticipation. It's actually the subject of a lot of research. If we were going to define it loosely, we could say it is the knowledge or the anticipation of a difficult task's end, which enables our bodies to expend energy in more efficient ways. That's what researchers define it as anyways. It's this interesting phenomenon. We see this in all kinds of distance runners, not just Simon Donato in his extreme case. If you've ever watched a marathon or if you've watched a cross-country race, it's these long races that take place over long distances, but for some reason always seem to be settled in the final seconds as runners make a mad dash for the finish line. The anticipation of the end. Seeing the finish line fills them with the energy they need to push past their exhaustion, to push past their limits, and to finish strong. And that's what this future-oriented hope is for us. God has given us a glimpse as a motivator. We never want to underestimate the value of knowing what lies ahead, what our hope is. But teleo-anticipation does have its limits. Runners still live in a world dictated by physics. And there is going to come a time, no matter how much they want it, no matter how motivated they are, where the body is going to collapse. Because it has limits. And that same thing holds true for you and I. We have limits. It doesn't matter how badly we may want it. Sometimes the world and its mess is so heavy and so discouraging, it crushes us under its weight. And that future hope, seeing the finish line, that's fantastic. That is a powerful thing. But just like my son learning music, I need something for now. Something today. God, I fully believe someday we're going to walk on streets of gold but I could sure use some of that pavement in my pocket right now because things are expensive and the economy is tough and we're down to one income and I don't know how we're going to make it through. Sometimes the weight of sin's mess weighs on us. Or God, I I fully believe someday our bodies are going to be restored and you're going to make all things new. But I could use some of that newness today because I just got off the phone with my doctor and it was not a good conversation. Sometimes the mess invades our lives and is felt so sharply that that future hope, that glimpse of the finish line just may not be enough. We need something now. And if all Christianity had to offer was this hope of someday, it might start to feel like a bit of a carrot on a string situation. Or there's this prize held out in front of us and God's just saying, just keep going, trust me, you're going to get it, just keep going. Thankfully, that's not the case. Our faith has a lot more to offer us than just a glimpse of the finish line. We actually have encouragement for today in the immediate to deal with life and sin's mess. And we experience the immediate good news of the gospel through the power and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's what our passage goes on to explain to us. If we keep reading in verse 26, it says, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Our passage starts off with a conjunctive phrase, in the same way. That tells us that what we just read previously has something to do with what we just read. In this case, it's this idea of groaning which ties all this together. We read that creation groans as in the pains of childbirth. It is longing in its present misery for some deliverance and some great blessing to arrive. It's looking to the future. 
we read that we ourselves groan as we eagerly wait for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. We too are looking to the future, longing for God's work of making all things new and finally putting the mess to rest. Our groaning has to deal with the future. What we just read is that the Spirit of God also groans right alongside of us. But His groaning isn't so much about what is to come. His groaning is about ministry to God's people today. Right now in the thick of the mess. Specifically, it talks about the way He intercedes. The way He takes our prayers and brings them before God so that they are intelligible and understood. And and we'll unpack that in a couple of minutes. But before we do, I just want to draw attention to the fact that God's presence is with us at all in the thick of this mess. That by itself is a huge blessing and encouragement. Jesus talks about this in in the book of John chapter 14. This is on the night of his betrayal. In just a few hours from this, he's going to be arrested. And then a few hours after that, he's going to be convicted and executed. So he's got a lot on his mind. And he's trying to wrap up a lot of loose ends really quickly. And so he has something to say about the Holy Spirit. And he says to his disciples, If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. And if we were to look at the ancient Greek that it was written in, that word advocate is the word paraclete. It's a really interesting word. Some English translations, they translate it as advocate. Sometimes they translate it as counselor or comforter or simply helper. And all of those are accurate. In fact, this word paraclete has a little bit of all of those words wrapped into it. It is a really fascinating word. God's going to send you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. God sent his spirit to dwell with us and in us. It's a way of saying we have this intimate relationship and connection with him, and that's huge. Because it means that God didn't look down from heaven just twiddling his thumbs saying, well, I showed him what it ends, you know, I hope they figure it out and make it make do. No, he looked down and he said, these people are going to need some help. Yes, they have this motivation. Yes, I've shown them what the future looks like. But they're going to need some help for today. So I'm going to go to them and I'm going to be that helper. The Holy Spirit dwells with us richly. And that is a huge blessing because sometimes the presence of a friend is all the motivation we need to keep moving forward. We saw this a few years back, 2016, there were two women who were training for the U.S. Olympic Marathon. Their names were, uh, I always get the first one wrong, I can't, okay, Shalane Flanagan and Amy Cragg. Shalane Flanagan and Amy Cragg. These were two women, they were good friends, they had trained together for a number of years. Uh, So when the day of the U.S. trials arrived, even though it was an individual event, you would have thought it was a team sport because they came like head to toe, matching gear, matching visors, matching outfits, matching shoes. They even had matching tan lines, some said, because they had trained together for so long. So these two women, the friends, they started in the the herd side by side, uh, the pack, that's the word, not the herd. They started in the pack side by side, and when the starting pistol went off, they made a break. They got to the front of the pack pretty quickly, and it didn't take very long for them to actually distance themselves and get a sizable lead. But somewhere in the middle of the race, Flanagan started to lag a little bit. She waved her friend forward, you keep going. But Amy Cragg didn't want to leave her friend behind. So even though she felt fine and she was taking some like good strides, she slowed down, slowed her pace to motivate her friend, to make sure she kept running. At one point, Craig ran forward, got two water bottles, came back, got one for Flanagan so they could both stay hydrated, and continued to stay by her friend's side and encourage her through the race. And it wasn't until kind of the last leg that Craig finally sprinted forward and, and secured her first place finish. But even then, she kept looking back to make sure that her friend was still running and was doing okay. And Flanagan was able to hold on and secure a third place position. But many people who have watched that race, whether they be runners, coaches, commentators, they all questioned if Amy Cragg hadn't stayed by her side, would Shalane Flanagan have placed as well or would she have even finished the race at all? 
Sometimes the presence of a friend is all we need to motivate us and help us continue moving forward. That's who the Holy Spirit is for us. He is that friend. He is that counselor, comforter, advocate, paraclete, whatever word you want to use. He is with us. And as Jesus says, in us. The Spirit of God encouraging us. Reminding us not only there is a finish line with a great victory awaiting, but I'm here with you in the thick of the mess, running beside you through it all. And that's a huge blessing. But if that were it, that might not be enough. Luckily, what we read in verse 26 is that the Holy Spirit isn't just with us, He's actually doing something as well. Part of His work is how He encourages us through this journey of life. We read about that in verse 26 and 27. Let's look at that together. I'm sorry, he intercedes for us in this mess. It says, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. What does it mean that he intercedes for us? Maybe you've experienced this before, but there are sometimes these seasons in life where we find ourselves discouraged, we find ourselves down in one of those messy situations that are hard, and those are the times when we recognize we probably need to lean on God the most, and we need to seek His presence the most and pray for strength the most. That's what we need, but for some reason, those tend to be the seasons when we shy away from God and lean on Him less. And we try to figure it out ourselves for some reason. It's kind of like being sick and knowing you need medicine and actually even having it measured out and dosed out, ready to go, but for some reason we just can't bring ourselves to take the medicine. Sometimes that's what it is with God. When we find ourselves in these hardships, we need Him the most and yet we resist Him the most. And it may sound odd and backwards, but we are sometimes odd and backwards people, are we not? We don't always make sense. And if you've been in one of those seasons, you probably resonate with what I'm saying here. And maybe the reason we shy away from God or we resist leaning on Him the most has to do with just really not knowing what to do. Sometimes we don't know what to pray. Sometimes we don't know if we should pray. Should I even ask God about this? Sometimes we might be so frustrated, we even lack the faith to believe prayer will do any good. God, I have a friend who is sick, and I know I should pray for you, But it seems like the writing's on the wall, so why even bother? God, I'm lonely, and I'm depressed, and I know that there's comfort to be found in you, but I I don't know what to say. I I don't know what to ask for. God, I'm angry. Because I've been wronged or slighted or I've been disappointed or or my vulnerabilities have have been touched upon. or For some reason, I'm just angry. Someone did me dirty, God. And I should pray to you about that, but it's not going to change what happened, so what's the point? Sometimes in those seasons, we just really don't know what to pray, how to pray. Sometimes we lack the faith to believe prayer makes a difference. And what we read in our passage is that in those moments... The Holy Spirit is there, not just with us, but taking those prayers uttered in weakness and bringing them before God and making them clear as day as to what our hearts really want to say and what they need. I sometimes compare it to pizza, and it's kind of a weird illustration, but go with me here. Pizza is pretty good. Even when it's bad, it's still pretty good, right? Like, I've, I've had a lot of bad pizza put in front of me before, but I still ate it. It's pretty good. And I'm sure somewhere, somebody has made a pizza so god-awful, nobody wants to touch it. But I've never personally seen that, right? Even when it's bad, yeah, it's still pretty good. And that's kind of what the Holy Spirit does with our prayers. Even when they're bad, He takes them and brings them before God so that they're pretty good. I know he kind of rambled and he kind of babbled or maybe he didn't really know what he was saying or what to ask for. Maybe he really didn't even know if he believed prayer would work, but you know what? It's pretty good. And in the Spirit's work of going between interceding for us, what we have is this promise that God actually hears us. Not just that he's listening, but that like he really hears and understands where we're at and what we're going through and what we need. 
And that may not seem like much, but honestly, that's huge. Feeling heard is one of the most basic and essential qualities of emotional and psychological health when we talk about the human experience. There's a guy that writes about this. His name is uh, Dr. Michael Nichols. In his book, The Lost Art of Listening, listen to what he says. Few aspects of human experience are as powerful as the yearning to be understood. When we think someone listens, we believe we are taken seriously, that our ideas and feelings are acknowledged, and that we have something to share. A listener's empathy builds a bond linking us to someone who seems to understand and care, thus confirming that our feelings are recognizable and legitimate. In other words, we need somebody who gets us. One of the most deepest, basic human longings is to be understood. And this work of the Holy Spirit understands, or assures us, God gets it. He understands our hurt. He understands our disappointment. He understands our frustrations. He understands our anxieties. He understands our fears, our depressions, our rage. He meets us in there and he says, I get it. I see you. I feel you. I really understand you. And like Dr. Nichols explains, feeling that somebody actually hears and understands us builds a bond between them and us. We draw nearer to God because He gets us, which is exactly what we need in those seasons where we feel most discouraged and weak and are tempted to lean away from Him. The Holy Spirit ministers to us in these ways, both standing beside us, encouraging us, and assuring us, God gets it, guys. He is with you here, not just in presence, emotionally, mentally. He gets it. But even that isn't the full extent of the Spirit's work. He's not just a listener. He's also a speaker. He encourages us as we make our way through this life journey. He provides for us words that we need to hear and truths that we need to believe in order to push through this difficult season. Listen to how Jesus describes it. This is back in John chapter 14 again, verse 26. He says, but the advocate... Paraclete, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. These are words that he gives to his disciples before he's about to depart. He says, the Spirit is going to come and remind you of everything that I've said to you. And you know what? You and I today, that's still true. He reminds us of what Jesus has said. And we could even extend that probably to include all of Scripture because as we read in 2 Timothy, all Scripture is God-breathed. It all has that same origin. The Holy Spirit reminds us the words of Scripture. Jesus elaborates chapter 16 of John. He says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear, but when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. Jesus is describing this speaking, this encouraging work of the Spirit today. It's not that there's a voice from the clouds that booms down and says, hey, here's what you need to do. But rather, the Spirit reminds us the words of Scripture and the truth that God has shared with us in His Word when we most need it. He's with us in those times where we are discouraged. He says, hey, I get it. I'm running beside you. I understand that you are frustrated or I understand that you are disappointed or I understand that life is just really hard and I completely get why you feel that way. And that's why in this moment I want to remind you what what you read in Scripture a few weeks ago in John when Jesus was speaking. I've told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble But take heart. I've overcome the world. And I want to remind you right now that if he's overcome, you will too if you abide in him. Keep running. The Holy Spirit runs beside us in those moments when we are frustrated and enraged. And he says, I get it. You are angry. You have been wronged. You have been hurt. Sin has encroached in your life in a very painful way. And I get it. You are right to feel this way. But in your anger, I want you also to remember something you read in your YouVersion Bible devotional. Yes, that is a plug. Get the YouVersion Bible app. Read it. But I want you to remember something you read in Romans. 
Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. God's not sitting on his hands. He sees, he's taking notes. He's not going to let this go. So right now in your anger, why don't you let him be judge and you be the one to let it go? The Holy Spirit runs beside us, speaking the words of truth that we need. Or maybe you're in the season where he's running beside you and he's saying, you, you're lonely. You're insecure. There's things about you you don't like. There's things about you you wish were different. I get it. The world is heaping abuses and messages upon you that just tear you down. But I want you to understand something that you read in Scripture a while back. When Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest. You will find peace. For your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Spirit meets us in our frustrations. He meets us in our weakness. God is present with us. He is hearing us and He is speaking to us the truths that we need in order to push through the mess and the difficulties of today. Yes, our faith has a phenomenal future-oriented hope. There is a finish line God has given us a glimpse of, and that can encourage us and spur us on. But he didn't just show us the end and leave us to figure it out. He sent his very spirit to walk with us and dwell with us and encourage us and be there beside us and really listen to us, to draw us closer to him and to speak to us these words of life and truth that Jesus himself desired to share with you. There's plenty of reason to be encouraged today by God's work in the now. So if you find yourself here today as, as somebody who is in the thick of the mess, if you're discouraged, if you're disenchanted, if you're angry, if you're hurt, if you're lethargic, whatever you may find yourself, I pray that these words would find their way into your heart and with one eye you keep a focus on what is to come because the finish line is ahead. But I hope more than anything you recognize God is with you today, now, with you in presence, with you listening, with you seeking to share life-giving truth so that you continue to run this race. And when you do cross that finish line, you do so as a champion. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your kindness and the compassion that you have upon us in our weakness at times. Though sometimes we stumble, though our faith may be limited or wavering, though we may just be frustrated and discouraged, I thank you that you're with us, that you motivate us and compel us to keep running towards the finish line, that your spirit is the strength that we need to push through our weakness. I pray that we would rely on him, that we would recognize your presence and that we would hide your word in our hearts, that he might be armed and equipped to pull that up to the forefront of our minds when we need it most. May that truth speak to us. May it breathe life into our weary legs that we keep running towards the finish line. And may we continually and persistently draw upon the strength that Jesus has supplied through his love and his grace. May his example guide us. May his sacrifice encourage us and motivate us. May we continually draw closer to him as we pursue you. It's in Christ's name we pray these things. Amen.